Today we have Dr. Martha Faraday. She is a PhD scientist in human realm. And then through her own chaos, started diving into the equine science realm to help her own horse. Then from there, she started getting calls for other animals and gave it a go. She just gave it a go with her knowledge, her human and horse knowledge and had a lot of success, you guys. Dr. Martha is not popular on the dog and cat space. So I actually had asked her to do a Facebook Live with me and my membership a couple of weeks ago. Whoops, I almost flipped my computer over. And it, it went really well, it was so informative. She had things that I had never heard of. And I was like, please, you have to come on the cancer-free canine page and share this really valuable, um, just out of the box ideas that nobody's talking about with this platform. You guys, cancer-free canine page was developed as a summit. And it was initially a summit in 2020 and 2021 during COVID. And then when pet summits took over, I felt like individual events, just having one-on-one, -on -one, like a podcast interview type situation was way more productive for you guys to hear about what is winning with other people. So you build hope and build ideas and ask your vets about these products and so we have a lot of great guest speakers in the past i'm super excited to welcome dr martha faraday to the cancer-free canine platform thank you for being here with us today oh goodness absolutely my pleasure and i hope i pray i assume you know the universe orders these things so there are things that will emerge in our conversation that will be helpful to one or more of the people who is listening um, as as um, as explained, you know, I got interested in canine cancers because of uh, the horse of my heart, who developed a very aggressive metastatic lymphoma and was given eight weeks to live, and um, that was highly motivating. Um, I'm a scientist by training, so I have the same level of training as your human physician does in pharmacology and physiology and biochemistry and cell biology and all the hard sciences. So I come into this question, these challenges around our animals with cancer, bringing the scientific background with me so I can use that to understand what might we target physiologically or biochemically. Um, I also bring to the equation uh, my love for all living beings, um, the four legs, sometimes easier to love than the two legs, <laughs> but um, my love for all of them. And I am a strong intuitive. So I do uh, empathically and intuitively tune in to your animal if I work with someone and to, to the situation, the emotions around the situation, the animal's role in your family. Um, very often these animals have powerful roles in your family dynamic. And uh, that is part of the equation for survival and for success. So, so that's what I bring into this. And I, I have some PowerPoint slides just to, mostly to organize our conversation and to make sure that uh, I do lay out for you in some order how I think about these cases. And because I am, I'm in a like basically barren internet area. <laughs> Polly has, Polly has my slides, so she can um, share, if you don't mind, Poppy, and then yes. she'll, she'll kindly advance them as, um, you know, as necessary. So, whoops, that didn't share right. Hold on, you guys. Let me, let me see if I can do this a different way. Let's see if uh, I can find you on my desktop. So. Um, I had it pulled up, you guys, and for some reason it's blocking cancer for canine success stories. Whoops. Where is it? I had it pulled up, ready to go in the queue. <laughs> There's the old of course. <laughs> of course. In your email, um, I actually had it on my on my um, 
I had it already pulled up, but I guess I will have to go through the email. So I apologize, you guys. I'm going to stop sharing and you, Martha, keep talking about whatever you want to talk about. I had you on as a guest on my other platform and, and you actually talked about eggplant, which I'd never heard of. And I was really blown away by that. Um, and, and we just had a little chat while I was um, getting ready to go live about not, not throwing the kitchen sink at everything. Yeah. So I, you know, there, it, there's this, there's a process I think to go through. So when, so when your animal gets diagnosed, I mean, this, this is, this is not a happy day. Um, and, and the, the immediate reaction can be, um, depending on what you're told about the seriousness of the condition that, okay, we have to move heaven and earth and do absolutely everything to save our creature. Um, and there's some validity to that. Sometimes you actually do have to do an awful lot if, if the disease process is very advanced. Um, but there also are situations where actually it's better to pick and choose and design a protocol that we start with and then we watch and see how does your animal respond. Um, sometimes you don't need all the guns. And you also may want to hold a gun or two in reserve in case the condition worsens and you need something else, you need another tool, or um, in case we do get the cancer to settle down and go away for a while. And, you know, sometimes they come back. So when they come back, we'd like to hit it with something it hasn't seen before, because sometimes that's more powerful. So picking and choosing, um, again, but it, that, that's largely driven by how your animal presents. Um, but you know, not everybody gets the same thing and not everybody gets or, or needs everything. You know, they don't all need everything. There we go. Perfect. Honestly, I had to re-save it. <laughs> no, in a different... All right, well, if I was oh. prepared, I could do it myself. But if I try and do it on my computer, we're, 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 we'll we'll have a presentation. So, um, so um, I, do you, can you put it in slideshow mode? So it'll do this. Okay, perfect. Okay. so. So, so anyway, that's me, Martha Faraday, PhD, scientist, animal nutritionist. I used to say equine because I was doing basically 100% horses, but way more people have dogs and cats than have horses. And so every time I would be working with a horse, almost every time, someone would say, well, wait, do you do dogs? Do you do cats? And so that's how, and of course, we have, we have cats. I don't have a dog right now. But um, so then I started picking up cases with dogs and cats here and there, and now I do a fair number of um, mostly seriously ill dogs and cats, not routine stuff. Um, so animals with cancers, animals in kidney and liver failure, animals with very, very serious infections that are not responding. Um, and I'll show you an example of one of those as part of this. So the picture of the white horse, so he's kind of my uh, spiritual mascot in all this. He was the, the horse of my heart who um, developed an aggressive metastatic lymphoma that was throughout his entire body and um, tried to kill him numerous times, um, but he did survive that cancer. It did go into remission and uh, he eventually did pass away, but he passed away of something else. The cancer was gone at that time. And he was a great teacher about, well, what have I got? Because there was nothing in the standard allopathic veterinary toolkit for this cancer. He was considered untreatable. Um, he was also considered unsalvageable, and I, it was recommended I euthanize him immediately, uh, which I did not do, and he got another three and a half years of life, and that was mostly a really, really good life, but he was my great teacher, so he's always in the back of my mind. Um, at the same time he was diagnosed, I had a cat diagnosed with a very aggressive squamous cell carcinoma, and she was my other teacher, so, so that's how I got here. So next slide, Paul. So before we kind of go into what nuts and bolts of this, it's very important to conceptualize what's a success. So I, this is my way of thinking about these animals. There are three kinds of successes in my view, and these categories are somewhat fluid. So animals may start in one and move into another. Uh, and when you start, you, you don't know, really, you don't know which category your animal's in. We, we all want them to end up 
hopefully in, in category three where the cancer is completely gone. We want that to happen. It doesn't always happen, and but there are other ways to think about success. So, so the three kinds are, the first is what I call a high quality life extension. So this animal comes into this protocol and they, they end up having a space of life that otherwise they would not have had because they were so seriously ill. And in this space, however long it might be, there is very high quality of life. So your, your dog returns to normal activities, normal appetite, normal energy, normal affect. So their life, life is good. The goal of all of these is life is to be good. We want good life, not any life, we want good life. The second is treating cancer as a chronic illness. And, and this is, um, this is a, a way of thinking that certainly has emerged in the human literature around cancers. But sometimes, you know, what you can do is the, the cancer doesn't really want to go away. Uh, so you kind of get it to stop or slow down or maybe just pull back. And as a consequence of that, allow the animal to have what is basically a normal life, again, high quality of life. So this is, again, a good life. There's still some cancer around. You might have a tumor sticking out. Um, maybe blood work looks a little funny. Maybe lesions on an ultrasound are there, but they're smaller and they're quiet and they're not interfering. And we can manage symptoms and your animal basically has a normal life, but you know the cancer's in the background. And that to me is a success. And the third one is the magic bullet. You know, this is where we want them all to go. When the cancer is gone, it goes away. Your animal is a cancer survivor in the sense that the cancer is eradicated and no one can find it anymore. They're restored to health and they have a normal life. Um, and I will say, I always leave these animals on some kind of maintenance program. You, you, you never, uh, you never know that you've totally outwitted this kind of disease. And so you don't want to go to zero. And I have every once in a while had an owner do that. And it, it, uh, uh, it was not a good idea. So keeping them on basically a protective maintenance program. So next slide, Poppy. Okay, how, what's the framework for success? Again, this is how I think about this when I work with people. Um, there's, a, there's some criteria for a successful outcome. One of them has to do with the characteristics of the guardians or the owners, however you think of yourself. Um, I most often think of us as guardians with um, moral responsibility as well as physical and financial responsibility for our charges. Some people think more in the owner framework, it doesn't matter. Nevertheless, you're responsible for this creature. So owners, guardians who are committed and flexible. So that's very important. They also need to have a very clear understanding of what does the animal want? So this is not trivial, if, especially if you have an animal who's quite ill at the beginning. Does this animal wish to carry on? Does this animal wish to continue in this body? It's, it's very difficult being the caretaker. And this is the, this is the absolute wrenching part of running a hospice. Um, and if, if any of you have been in this position, you know, hospice is rough because you have to bear witness to whatever might be going on that is difficult to watch. You may have to observe suffering, but the animal has to live it. And so understanding that your animal does choose to be here, does want to be here and does want to try. And only you, only you can know that. I, I cannot know that. I will ask. And I want to be confident you have a clear answer. Um, the other part of this is resources. And you know, no one likes to talk about money, but um, things cost money. And sometimes what we can do for an animal is gonna be at least partly controlled by the resources that the guardian or owner may have available. This is less of a problem generally with small animals, but it can become formidable with big animals. You know, the dosing for a 1300 pound animal, a horse, let's say, the expense there is gonna be considerably more than if you're treating a 22 pound dog. So, so that's, just, that's just the reality. You are not required to mortgage your house to pay for your dog's care. You are not required um, to be perfect. Uh, and again, this is something that often comes up very early on in my relationship with clients. You're not required to be perfect. What you are required to do, in my view, is to proceed from a basis of love. That's all. 
That doesn't mean you have $10 million and that's fine. Um, Voltaire said, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Remember that, you, we're, our goal is not perfection. We want good, we want good life, good life that works for everybody. The animal, the traits of the animal that are important. So the animal's got to want it, you know? If an animal doesn't really want to go on and they feel like they are done in this lifetime, it doesn't pass a certain point, whatever you do won't work. So they got to want it, they want to live. Most animals that come into a relationship with me through their owners have that underlying push that they want to be here. Um, and the animal has to be flexible. And I'll give you an example of that in a few minutes. So flexibility is important because you might have to eat some weird things or you might have to put up with some routines that you know have not been what you've done before. Models of care, I'm a pragmatist. When I work with people, I'll work however you want. I have clients who do not want any Western medicine to touch one of their dog's lips. <laughs> and I have clients who want um, have gone through the traditional care path and, and had success or had success and then failure. And I'll, I'll give, show you an example of that. Um, and I have clients who want to do both, want to leverage the strengths of both. And I will work with you however you wish to work. I can collaborate with your vet. I can help you minimize side effects if you are choosing to do chemo and radiation or chemo or radiation. There are tools for that. Um, we can pick up after that and and uh, transition to a more holistic model if you choose. There are lots of ways to work. So the successful equation for your animal is the one that worked. And I don't care what the pieces are. That's what the successful equation is. So next slide, Poppy. Other factors. Okay, what type of cancer your dog has? In, in my clinical experience, hemangiomas are the hardest, they're the hardest to leverage um, versus lymphoma, sarcoma, squamous cell carcinoma. So that can be the toughest one, mostly because of the risk of bleeding, because that can be a, a sudden onset catastrophe. And you just don't have time to fix things when that happens. The stage and extent of cancer. So clearly, if you just found it and it's very early, that's easier to shift typically than if it's very advanced. And then whether it's a localized, you have one single lesion in one place versus this has now kind of started to move through your animal's body. It's metastatic, you have lesions in multiple organs. And typically those are also causing symptoms in multiple organs, that's harder. Not that any of it is not possible, it's just harder. The age of the animal is an important variable. The hardest animals to help are those that are very, very young. And I have mostly seen this in cats. So kittens who are literally three months old and have a massive tumor, squamous cell carcinoma growing out of their mouth. Um, those are, is there's something pathologically wrong with, with that animal's immune system. They came into the world this way. Those are really hard to help. And then animals who are, who are quite elderly, that's harder. They don't have the resilience of youth. They don't have the physiological resources of a younger animal, but there are, there are some good successes with older animals. But again, yeah, that's just kind of part of what's weighed in terms of you know, what should we start with? What should we not start with? Your animal's overall state of health and whether they have other medical issues, that's important because those can make trying to focus only on the cancer more complicated, especially if those are not adequately managed. So next slide. So my approach. So, you know, I, I got interested in this because originally I was an equine nutritionist and then I realized, well, boy, we need, um, for horses certainly, there's so many sick horses with so many different things wrong with them. Not only do we need to optimize diet, but we need to start to pull apart these other um, chronic disease states and acute disease states and stop these things from happening by harnessing the body's capacity to heal, which is always present. And that's a fundamental premise of how I work. So from the dietary perspective, making sure your dog has what I call a foundation diet in place. And the foundation diet is one in which their basic macro and micronutrient needs are met. So they're getting on a daily basis, the vitamins and minerals they need, they're getting enough protein, they get enough carbohydrates, all of that. So, so you want that in place. And it's no different for any animal, dogs, cats, horses. I have a treat in an iguana, but you know, a cow once, um, and turkeys, turkeys too. So same thing. 
So ideally the diet is anti-inflammatory. Um, inflammation is your enemy with all chronic disease states, it certainly is your enemy with cancer. Cancers promote inflammation, they like inflammation. So you don't want whatever is going into your dog's mouth to be pushing that inflammatory state up. You want your food to be ideally anti-inflammatory. And you can take a look at your, um, your dog food label, although uh, the problem with reading labels is once you start reading labels, you very quickly then start ripping your hair out because it's, it's very difficult. Um, I don't know um, in the UK what the dog food is like, but certainly in this country, most of it contains things that probably should not go into dogs. Um, one of those is soy. So if, again, read your labels, soy is hidden in all animal foods. It's hidden in our food. Um, the reason, two reasons you don't want soy in an animal with cancer is first of all, it's incredibly pro-inflammatory. You don't need that. But the second is it, it's all almost all GMO, which means it's all contaminated with Roundup. You do not, your dog does not need a little bit of pesticide with every mouthful. It's not helpful. You know, it's not helpful. It screws up digestion, stresses the liver. You don't need it. So if you start looking at your labels and go, oh Lord, there's soybean oil because it's in virtually everything. So, you know, ideally we find a way to work around that. You also want to minimize or eliminate heavy metal exposure. So this sounds kind of odd because no one's going to list on the label. Well, we put a little mercury in there. Um, but oddly, if you look at a lot of animal food labels, dog and cat, this is it's ubiquitous with horses, but they often put beet pulp in there. Now, I wasn't really paying much attention to this until recently. And then uh, once I started reading the cat food labels, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna have to cook for nine cats. Um, but there's beet pulp in a lot of cat food and there's beet pulp in a lot of dog food. And it, it's the fibrous part of the sugar beet after the sugar has been extracted. And it's, it's in tons, it's in horse feed very often. All right, why don't you want that? Because beet pulp, uh, the sugar extraction is a chemical process and the sugar, once it's pulled out of the beet and it leaves a very nice fiber behind, which is a very gut friendly fiber, which is why it's in these foods, it's contaminated with aluminum. So another thing you don't need in your, dog's meal is a little bit of aluminum with every meal. So yeah, don't need it. Um, do need some pre-probiotics and sometimes I have specific recommendations for that depending on how your dog presents and whether your dog is having some gut issues or has a history of gut issues. It's important to manage other conditions, both of the diet. So if your dog has other problems, I, I just had a lady um, bring me, not to leave here, thankfully, a 90 pound Rottweiler um, who was a lovely, lovely dog who has uh, seizures and also just developed what looks like a squamous cell carcinoma between his toes. And he has a long history of gut uproar, very long history. And I, I in, in taking his history and, and um, kind of talking with her and then going over him, it's very clear that the, the diet is driving the seizures. And the, um, so one of the pieces for him before we even start with the carcinoma between his toes is we need you on a diet that quiets your brain, not a diet that is pushing your th seizure threshold down because seizing, if you've got, you don't need to be seizing if you're trying to fight a cancer. So we need to get all body systems back in good working order. His gut is also very unhappy. So his protocol is, is heavily focused on gut health um, and finding him something he can eat that isn't going to be seizure promoting, which turned out to be very difficult, partly because uh, for a big dog who needs a fair amount of food, not having it cost $50 a day was complicated. So anyway, we did find that. And then managing those other conditions that needed with specific supplements. So if your, your, your animal has got, has a gut history, they have chronic pain, they have, um, they have skin issues, whatever else they have, we wanna manage those things because if they aren't managed, these are distractions for your body's, the body's ability to focus on the cancer. So we want your, your, your dog's resilience focused on, I need to work on this cancer and get this under control, not to be distracted by um, you know, kidney function that's not great. So, so that's, that's sort of the way I think about that. Next slide, please.
All oh, then there are the cancer specific pieces and there's a whole bunch of these and this, this isn't a complete list, but it's in the categories that I work from. So the things I have the most experience with and the most success with are medicinal mushroom extracts. These are not the whole mushroom. These are not, um, and, and when you buy medicinal mushrooms, you have to be very cognizant of one piece, which you're probably not gonna know. So the properties of the mushroom, because the manufacturer is not gonna tell you this, the property of the mushroom is heavily driven by how it was grown. So what was it grown on? Um, so that matters in terms of its chemical properties. The whole mushroom is not nearly as powerful as a mushroom, as an extract. Um, so, so again, just bear that in mind. So I use a fair number of medicinal mushroom extracts, um, herbs, depending on, again, the, the presentation, how does this animal look, sometimes specific nutrients such as antioxidants, um, other things that could be in the mix, depending. Um, one is systemic enzyme therapy. And Poppy, you and I have talked about this. So enzymes are helpful you know, for digestion, but here, when we use systemic enzymes, we use very high doses of enzymes. They, they by themselves do not have a cancer effect, but they have an anti-inflammatory effect and they have some other properties that sometimes are useful. So if you have a tumor, for example, that has caused a lot of tissue scarring, systemic enzymes can remove the scarring and that is helpful. Therapeutic clays I use, especially with animals who have gut symptoms. Um, eggplant extract, Poppy mentioned at the beginning. So again, this is an extract. It's, it's, not, it's not the plant itself. Um, and that's an important distinction because if you, if you eat eggplant or you feed them eggplant, it's not gonna do anything. So extracts are typically 50 to 100 or 200 times stronger than the raw plant. So this is a specific constituent of eggplant. There is a human literature and you can Google this. If you Google eggplant extract, it will come up. It is used for skin cancers, um, and there are some significant successes there. It is sold as a, a topical cream that can be put on skin cancers. So there is a human literature there. In uh, cell culture, it pretty much kills every kind of cancer cell that there is. So why, why aren't we just flooding all these animals with eggplant extract? Because cell culture studies may or may not extrapolate to a whole animal. So in a cell culture, you have cancer cells and you dump some eggplant extract and it zaps them. But in an animal, the, the cancer cells are in a tumor, in a tissue. You're feeding the extract. It has to go through the gut. It has to actually get to the cancer. And the dosing for that is largely unknown. So I do sometimes use it, but I often hold it to see, do we really need this? Um, so eggplant extract. So Google that and you'll see some interesting things come up. Homeopathy. So this is a very different modality. And if you have training or experience in this, you understand this. Uh, this is a very different way of thinking about the body's healing capacity. Homeopathy is aimed at leveraging what is called the vital force, meaning that what we call life, that thing you see and feel when your dog is playing, life, movement, the energy of that. You can't even really define it, but it's what distinguishes something living from something not living. And homeopathy is oriented toward leveraging the, the, the body's capacity to repair that vital force and that vital force's capacity to repair, in theory, anything that goes wrong. Um, this is a very complex and nuanced field. Um, picking the correct remedy is very important. It, it, it's important with any major illness. It's very important with cancers and picking the correct potency, the strength, and then how you dose that. Um, I use some of this, I'm moving more in this direction, mostly because I think we are not leveraging this as much as we could, and it can be very powerful, and it has the virtue of being very, very inexpensive. What I'm doing with it is based on the work of, um, there's a book by Dr. Ramakrishnan on cancers and homeopathy. This is human, he only, I think he's still alive. He only works with people. His uh, protocols there are very helpful to inform animal protocols, although um, I've modified them and other people have. They're very, it's, it's too complicated to do with an animal. But, but if you're interested in homeopathy and cancer, that's a very interesting book um, to read. So, so those are other tools. 
you can use them all. You can use specific ones. I try and pick the ones I think in this specific case as a starting point, this makes the most sense to me. So let's do this. And then if it evolves, it evolves. So these three categories of um, success. So high quality life extension. So Georgia, she, so you can see her there clearly. She's the older pug, she was 15. When that picture was taken, she came to me. Um, she had massive metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. It was in her mouth, her jaw, her neck. She had hard masses in her neck. The vet felt she had systemic metastases. Her owner chose no treatment, uh, felt that that was simply not worth doing at her age. And uh, the chance of any kind of success was going to be I mean, basically minimal. She was not eating. She had very heavy nasal discharge that clogged up her nose all the time. So her nose had to be cleaned out multiple times a day. She had a hard time eating even when she wanted to, and she's very, very tired. So um, put her on a protocol and very quickly within, I think within the first two weeks, her appetite came back. So appetite coming back for dogs is a very important indicator of, wow, I feel better. So appetite came back, her nasal discharge stopped. I wasn't entirely sure that that would happen, but her owner was thrilled because she could breathe better. She panted less and she didn't have to have her nose constantly clean, which she did not like. She was able to eat more easily. Her energy and her mood improved. And she had two younger dogs in the household, which I think were three and four. So she was tearing around the house with the youngsters for the next four months. Um, it was very important to her owner and possibly to Georgia. I don't know. Um, I didn't meet Georgia in person, but her owner wanted to have a sweet 16 party for her. It was a very important benchmark in their life together. Um, she had had her her entire life. So at age 16, she turned 16, she was doing great. She felt well. She had a super fancy party <laughs> with lots of other dogs and presents and all kinds of stuff. Um, and she, it, it was good. It was good. Um, she, um, a few weeks after that, she stopped eating and she, she crashed quickly. Um, like on a Friday and her owner knew immediately she was done. And, um, so she let her go. So, but she had, I count this as a success because she had four really outstanding months. I mean, really good months. She was a happy, happy girl. And her owner was so happy she had that time. So happy she had that time. So it was good. So next slide. So, Dr. Martha, can we talk yeah. about this really quick? Your sure. protocol involves ev like the kitchen sink of the herbs, the mushrooms, the homeopathy, the enzymatic therapy, the diet change. Like you just, you had nothing left, nothing to lose, right? I, no, I didn't put the kitchen sink with her because, you know, again, some of this is owner tolerance for doing this stuff, right? So not everybody wants to rearrange their entire schedule to do 16 things two or three times a day. All right. That's a legitimate part of the equation. Most of us work. Um, you may not work. You may have other responsibilities. So in this case, her owner um, had things she was willing to do. She, she did not. But I, I knew from the initial conversation, she was not going to do seven things. She might do four things. Okay, so I picked like the top four. So in this case, um, medicinal mushrooms, because that's the one I've consistently had the most success with. We did not do eggplant with her. I did do systemic enzymes because she had all kinds of scarring up in her mouth, up in her nose. And what I was hoping is that would stop that, the, the kind of the breathing and the nasal discharge issues. Um, I, the mushrooms probably also helped there because I think there was also some low grade infection there. And then I have to look back at what else I did. Something, something for her gut to kind of perk her up so she would feel like eating. And then we just left it there because she uptick really fast. So you're good, right? And sometimes when they're good, you should leave it alone. <laughs> Um, and again, you know, not everyone wants to do every single thing and that's fine. So I picked, this is what I think will work for you. This works with the logistics of your life. This works with what you can get into this dog because, you know, she wasn't eating super well and she, she, she drooled a lot of food out. So a lot of this had to be syringed into her and there's only so much you can syringe in twice a day without your animal deciding I don't want to do this. So, and again, she's 15. Now, if she were five, 
than she presented with us and a different, somewhat different scenario, I would have suggested, I would have pushed a little harder and say, hey, let's, let's ramp this up. But that, that wasn't what was desired in this situation. So. And you know. Dr. Faraday, when you say systemic enzymes, you're talking about serapeptase. I'm talking about serapeptase, yes. Yeah. So um, the product called Seroquin, which is, um, it is, there's a, a dog and an equine product. So it's mostly serapeptase. It's got some other enzymes in there, but that is what I used with her. Yes. Can you, can you tell our viewers what serapeptase actually is? So it's not a digestive enzyme, you guys. It is actually an anti-inflammatory type of systemic enzyme. Right. So it's a, so all, all enzymes have a digestive action and so serapeptase does too. So the difference between taking digestive enzymes to facilitate digestion and taking systemic enzymes to facilitate inflammation control and scarring removal is dosing. So when you take, you know, you take a little enzyme capsule with your food because you know, you you feel like your digestion is better if you're giving your your animal digestive enzymes. The, the the dosing is such that those enzymes are released in the stomach and they they work on food in the stomach and small intestine. Systemic enzymes are much much higher doses. So what happens is a little bit of that gets used up in digestion, but the rest of it's not needed, and that goes into circulation. It crosses the gut wall. It's available in the bloodstream and it can go into other tissues. And it has, because of the chemical structure of enzymes, it has the ability to interact. With, so this is probably more technical than you want, but the, the cyclooxygenase cascades, which are the, the, the chemical cascades that turn inflammation on in the body, in the mammalian body. So it can interact with those cascades and, and they don't shut them off because you don't want them off. You just want them quieter. Um, so they are able to do that when you take them in high doses. So the dosing is the difference. So serapeptase is a very powerful enzyme. The seroquin product is a, it's a mix of enzymes. There's other ones in there as well. Um, and then there is, often people say, well, what about for people? There is a human product that is the serapeptase, that is the human version of this. So with, with her, because of all this clogging and blockage in her face and neck and the breathing and the nasal discharge. I thought, well, let, let's, you know, let's just do this because I think this is just going to help with that. And, and it did, it did. So, okay, here's another example of high quality life extension. So this is Boo. That's actually not a picture of Boo because I didn't have one. So that's a stock picture of a Springer Spaniel. But Boo is eight years old and he was diagnosed with hemangioma. Um, he had a huge abdominal lesion. I mean, it was several inches long. Um, there were metastases in his spleen and in his lungs. Originally, surgery was discussed. The, the kind of the consensus after his owner saw several sur surgeons was there, there's just, this is too risky for him. He was not eating. He was very tired and he was depressed. Um, and this was, this dog, came from a very traumatic background before he was adopted. Um, he was running loose in a pack and he had seen his, all his pack mates shot and he was the only survivor. So he came from a terrible, terrible traumatic past, which probably did not help his immune system. So Anyway, it, you know, so put him on a protocol here. This there's more. This was a lot more of the kitchen sink because this he's eight. He's eight. Right. He still has potentially a good amount of life left. So we actually did much more with him. He did get the eggplant extract um, on top of the mushrooms, some herbs. I don't think he was on seroquin. I, I was a little worried about bleeding risk for him. I didn't want to take away any scarring that might be preventing bleeding. So we didn't do that. Um, but again, very quickly, within 10 days, he started eating again. He perked up. He was not depressed. His energy returned to normal and normal for him was very, very high. He was bouncing around the house, bouncing around the yard. He had a, um, a, his other his friend who was another dog. They were tearing around the yard, chasing things, playing, tumbling, rolling. So for all purposes, you looked at him and this looked like a normal, healthy, very high energy spaniel. Um, this went on for four months. He did not miss a beat. 
Um, I, I checked in with his owner very often. I was concerned about him because of this kind of lesion. It's, it's very difficult to control. But every time she said, he's great, he's happy, he's eating, he's playing, he's great. He's just so happy. And then he literally collapsed one evening. He was tearing around the yard. He came in the house and hit the floor and um, was rushed to the medical center. He was bleeding heavily internally. They tried some things, they could not stop it. Um, and so he left over the course of a couple of hours. So, now, Dr. Martha, do you ever use Union Bio? I don't know what that is. It is a um, Chinese herb that stops hemorrhaging. Mm, it's no. actually really effective. It's it's something that you should have probably in your pocket um, okay. if you do have this type of possible bleeding hemorrhaging type thing. It will actually postpone any rupturing. Got it. It's can pretty you, great. You can, can get you, it at like Walmart even. Okay. Can you just just email me the name of that poppy? I would love to. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So so that so that was Boo. Um, this obviously is not a dog, unless it's a very strange breed. This is a cat, but it's a, it's she's a good example. So Molly's eight. Um, she has a fibrosarcoma under her tongue, and so she cannot use her tongue. So just ponder what that means. If you can't use your tongue. She can't eat, she can't drink, she can kind of swallow, but she can't move her tongue. So, so um, the young lady who had just adopted her um, was told, she saw two vets, she was told this just absolutely hopeless, just seasonizer. So the guardian in this case feels really strongly this cat's not ready to go. So she, she, she asked me what to do and I said, Ugh. Okay, but you're gonna have to syringe everything. So, so a lot of this depends on will she accept that? Would Molly accept that? So Molly actually accepted it immediately. So, so, so when I first encountered this cat, this is six or seven weeks ago, um, and this young lady, so this takes 90 minutes, three times a day to get food into this cat because of what she has to do. And it's not just food, she's, um, some medicinal mushrooms, some eggplant. I can't remember what else. Again, I'd have to look. She's gotten more of the kitchen sink because again, she's young. The cancer is very aggressive. And we, we just added some homeopathy to that to see if we can get the lesion. Even if it would go down by 10%, she might get some control of her tongue. So, um, you know, not everyone wants to do this. And I'm not saying that if you don't want to do this, you're a bad person, but it's an excellent example of a situation in which the guardian is infinitely flexible and so is the animal because not every animal would tolerate this. Of the cats we have, I can think of one that would let me do this. The others would rather die. And, and honestly, I don't mean that in, in a, um, a humorous sense, you know, having preferences and making choices about your quality of life is perfectly legitimate. So if Molly didn't want to do this, that's fine. That's fine too. But Molly's on board, this continues. Um, she's at week seven, I think, of this. She's not worse, not better. And owner guardian, I just told her, just watch her for sign that she wants to stop. You know, only you will know. So we carry on. But infinitely flexible cat, infinitely flexible guardian. So yeah, an example. All right, cancer is a chronic illness. So, um, you know, this is that category where you're, you're, you don't quite get rid of it, but it, it's okay. It's okay because the animal basically carries on as normal. So this is Darby dressed for Christmas in the top picture. Um, she's a 13 year old Doberman. That's, that's very, very senior for a Doberman. So I will say her owner has a very sophisticated raw food feeding program and has fed her that way her entire life. So this, She's a good example of how if you start from puppyhood feeding correctly and not feeding things that are um, going to create problems that you can have a very long, long good life. So you can see by her body condition, she's also in excellent shape for a senior Doberman. So Darby came to me because she had a sarcoma on her front leg. It was nasty. It was growing rapidly. Um, it had been biopsied. It was malignant. Um, she also had some non-cancer issues that are more old dog issues. So 
Her hind end was quite weak. She could no longer get up on the couch. She really couldn't run. She had some heartbeat irregularities. They were intermittent. They were sort of there in the background. Again, older dog. Um, radiation was suggested, but it was going to be something like 19 cycles of radiation, and the owner declined that. She felt that was too hard, uh, given that she was 13. So, you know, she, and the, the thing on her leg was like the size of a, I don't know, between a golf, so sort of the size of a lemon. So it was significant. Um, so on the protocol, the tumor, it slowed down. It also kind of knit itself together and became more um, kind of almost pendulous. Um, at this point, the vet, who she was still seeing regularly, said, you know, we could, why don't we just take it off? And so the owner agreed because she was concerned. So she had the surgery. That went fine. It kind of came off really cleanly. They didn't dig around there for margins, but it came out cleanly. It, it healed fine. And so they just, just left it alone. Um, her, her energy and her strength came back. <clears throat> she got, um, she was on systemic enzymes more for her <clears throat> hind end issues really than the cancer per se. Um, and also on mushrooms. What else? There's something else for her. I'm blanking on that. Oh, and, and also I used actually different mushroom extracts because she was a little neurological too. And so I used one that stimulates release of nerve growth factor which um, helps the nervous system repair itself. So on the protocol, so we go through all this and she got, I don't know, about a month in, and then she, um, she physically perked up considerably. And then uh, about two months, she was able to jump back on the couch, which was a shock because she hadn't been able to do that in about 18 months. And then our owner sent me a video at about three months, she is ripping around the yard, <laughs> like she's two very high speed. So the weakness had completely remitted her cardiac issues. They're, they're still there, but they're not worse. They're stable. Um, and it, the tumor has not come back. So she, you know, they watch the site, but basically for a 13 year old Doberman, is it totally gone? I don't know if you poked around in there, you could probably find some, um, but they just leave it alone and she's good. So we're eight and a half months into this. She's good. The dog is happy. The owner's happy. And some of her non-cancer stuff has resolved and she's, again, she's comfortable and she has excellent quality of life. So, so that's Darby. So cancer is a chronic illness. So that can be a great outcome. Dar um, that's an amazing outcome. And Dr. Faraday is the second photo on the bottom of your slide an after photo. Um, yes. Cause that's a more recent photo. She looks like a way younger dog. I know, right? So you look at her, you're like, she could be five, right? So she's, she's, you know, she's, she's, she's good. She's good. But, you know, owner, very important here, the fact that this animal had always been fed beautifully, because that really makes a difference. She probably wouldn't have made it to 13 without that piece in the mix. And then her, her ability to just sort of stay in this, you know, this is, this is a good limbo. There's no recurrence. She's good. As her owner and I have discussed, she is not going to live forever. She's not going to be the first twenty-year-old Doberman, right? It's not. It's not going to happen realistically. But she is very, very strong and healthy now, and that is goes on as long as it goes on. So, if we are stewards to that, you've done your job. So, the third category, you know, the one where we all want to be, and in some ways, this is the hardest place to get um, cancer remission eradication. So, so you get it to go away and no one can find it. Yay, right, that's perfect. <laughs> so Sullivan is a 12 year old pug and Sullivan came to me after a long foray through other avenues. Um, ironically, uh, he was referred to me in September, 2020, but his owners were um, not convinced of the validity of non-medical approaches at that time. So they chose to go the standard route. And uh, so he had lymphoma, it was throughout in, in multiple lymph nodes in his liver and in his spleen. So September, 2020, he had a round of uh, multiple rounds of chemo and it went away and he was good until January of 2023. And he stopped eating in January and they took him back and had him rechecked and it had come back. Um, they tried the same chemo protocol again. It did not work. They tried it one more time and it did not work. 
So by the time he came to me, now we're April, 2023, he has lesions in his liver, he has lesions in his spleen, lymph nodes are enlarged. Um, these lesions are growing. He has stopped eating. He is lethargic. He is sitting under the, the dining room table. He, he won't move. So he won't eat, he won't move. And when his owners wanted to touch him, he would cry out in pain. So he was miserable. And, you know, sometimes people only come in the direction of holistic care at a pure desperation. And this is one of those cases. So um, <laughs> it's always kind of funny being the receiving end of withering skepticism, <laughs> but, but you know, <laughs> right? Um, so also Sully, he, this is where the, the family role of the dog was very important. So Sully had a very important role in his family. It was a complicated family situation with a lot of pressures with aging parents. And so, so there's just a lot going on. And Sully was kind of the one that held things together and kept people sane. And so there was uh, a dynamic around his health where he needed to be healthy for him, but he also needed to be healthy for everyone else. So that was part of what was going on here. So um, I spoke with his guardians, I think April 7th of this year and explained how I would approach this. And they were politely, very polite and very skeptical, but you could feel it coming through the phone. <laughs> so, so, you know, and they basically at the end of it, they said, well, we have nothing to lose. I said, no, you have nothing to lose. I said, if anything, none of this will make him worse. It, it won't. So because he wasn't eating, a lot of his protocol was focused on kind of kickstarting his gut to wake up his appetite. Because if they won't eat, you're not going to get very far. Um, and so I sent them, he was, they were actually local to me and the fastest way to get things to them was to mail it to them. So I mailed them all kinds of things. Um, some probiotics, a lot of mushrooms, a lot of mushrooms, um, some therapeutic clays, did not use the eggplant extract. And that was mostly an intuition that he, that wasn't going to be quite right right now for him. Um, so anyway, sent them that stuff. He wasn't eating. So they said, what do we do? I said, you, you got to get it in him. It won't work if it doesn't go in. So they started syringing. He did not really like that. <laughs> So that started on the 15th of April. By April 18th, they emailed and said he stood up on the 18th and he went to his bowl. So they fed him and he ate. By the 20th, he was playing. He was carrying his toys around the house. He was regaining his energy. Um, he became really over the next two weeks puppy-like, they said. He was behaving as he did as a puppy. On May 1st, so, so they... They, um, these owners have regular follow-up work with the oncology vet. So every few weeks or months, or a few weeks, I think they do blood work. And then every few months they have another scan. So on May 1st, they took him back. This was a follow-up and, and the oncologist view was this was to document. So how bad is it now? She, she actually, they had sent him home to die. Um, they had told them at the time on you know, when he went home in April, he's not going to live. And uh, they gave them some steroids and they said, he's, he's not going to live. So you need to prepare yourself for euthanasia. Um, so that was their point of view. So they brought him back to um, see how bad it was now. And the blood work was normal. That's and, amazing. I'm well, freaking so, out. Like, so that this, was so fast. So, so this is one of those weird ones. So and then the, on the ultrasound, there were no lesions. And in fact, they, they couldn't believe there were no lesions and they did it again and there were no lesions. And so at this point, they asked, they asked the owner, what did you do? Because if you fail chemo twice, this is not the chemo and they know that. And, and they, you know, they had said they were going to see some kind of witch doctor person. Um, so, so this is one of those cases where I mostly feel like I just need to get out of the way because this animal's karma and path and physiological resilience is has pushed him into this but this has continued so now we're what the end of August so they have now multiple sets of blood work and multiple scans and he has no cancer it's no one can find it right so he's in this happy category so um I can't explain why this happened so 
quickly. What I thought would happen, I, I did, and, and they had asked me what's going to happen. I said, well, first of all, I think he'll start eating. So that would be good. And then, then I don't know, past then we have to see. So what I'd hoped is that the lesions would just become static and stop growing. So when they, they told me literally two weeks later, oh, by the way, all those, <laughs> the cancer is gone. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I have never seen a dog turn around that fast. And if we didn't have all the scans from prior and all the records and all the dire predictions documenting in the records, dogs at the end of life, recommended for euthanasia, all this stuff, then I would think that perhaps I was hallucinating. But nevertheless, um, this is the value of having some kind of follow-up because it does, it does help validate the approach because I can say, look, your dog's eating and happy and fine. But if someone does a scan and says, and the cancer's gone, then there's not any questions. So, right. so, he, so you know, so it's, it's really helpful. It's really helpful to know that. Um, you don't have to do that. I'm not telling you that you absolutely have to do that. But from a validity perspective, to make the argument that, yes, this can work, um, it's very, very helpful. Um, so, so, so as so of people are now, asking, what was your protocol? Now, I, I know you use clays and I've used clays in the past. I had a really bad experience with a, a bone cancer, a sar uh, osteosarcoma and clay. It actually lit it on fire. So I got really freaked out about using clay, but this makes total sense that it grabbed onto the histamines and the inflammation and the toxins. And yeah, well, he, you know, he's not the, so did the, what, how, what role did the clay play in here? I, I, I don't, cause one of the things is when you, the problem when you do a lot of stuff is you don't know, is each one doing 10% or did one do 80% and the others did 2%. So, so you don't know. And that, and do you need to know? You don't, you don't need to know what we want is this to happen. So this happened so fabulous. So do I know what each piece did? No. So would I predict to you what kicked it? That was the mushrooms, hands down. So the mushrooms rock at lymphoma. Um, they also rock at lots of other kinds of cancers because they do, they do three things. They, they kick down inflammation. They push the immune system and stimulate it to fight, fight, fight. Because when you get to this point, his immune system had to kick in. There is nothing we can do here. If the chemo didn't work, he has to handle it. We can't, there's nothing we can do. So they push the immune system to fight. And then some of them have direct cancer killing actions and they can also cut off tumor blood supplies. So the mushrooms, I put him on a fairly high dose for an animal of his weight because I was betting if anything can kick this, the mushrooms are gonna kick it for you. The clay- okay, so I'm gonna jump in there because one of the comment questions was, can you give too much mushrooms? I don't know. Um, <laughs> is there a toxic know. level or so the thing is, so, so when you're out, so we're hanging off the edge here in terms of how to do these things. So the problem is, so my background is in evidence-based medicine. So it's all about data. The problem is no one, no one is going to do a study on dogs with X, where we do what in, in my other world, we call a dose response curve. And so we dose animals at a low dose, a medium dose, a high dose, and a super high dose of a mushroom, or, or we have many, many groups and we use different mushrooms, or we cocktail the mushrooms. In his case, I cocktail the mushrooms, actually a massive cocktail of mushrooms, um, to figure out what's the best dose. So that is never going to happen. So you're, you're seat of the pants. The only dosing for mushrooms that's been worked out is for turkey tail mushrooms. There are some studies at UPenn. I think there's only two studies. They were working on hemangioma. Um, so there is kind of a dose for turkey tail extract, 100 milligrams per kilogram. However, they only tested one dose. So do we know would less work fine? Would three times as much work better? We don't know. So, so we just don't have those data. The other thing about the mushrooms is if you're going to do this, you really need to know what they're grown on because the substrate on which they're grown affects the properties, especially the inflammatory or pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory properties. So I only use mushrooms from one company that I know well, where I know the owner and I know how they're grown and how the extraction is done. So I trust those 
I okay, don't people need... want to know what they are. People are asking what in the chat, what are? mushroom company do you use? This is an equine company. So it's Immubiome. They make uh, medicinal mushroom-based supplements for horses. However, these are human-grade supplements. Um, you can take them. I take some. I have some human clients who take them. So here's the thing, though. I'm using the raw extracts, not the supplements. So, so I've asked. You can't go on their website and buy that. No. You have to actually call them or call you to get them. You, they, it would depend. They're, they're not going to sell everybody their raw materials, right? So I have access to the raw extracts because I have a relationship with the company. So I can send clients to the company um, with the recommendation for what I'd like the animal to have. Sometimes it's just easier for me to mail it to you because I have them here. So sometimes I just mail them, but you can't get them on the website. And the, the dosing, we have to have a conversation around that. That depends on how bad your animal is, how much they weigh, and the cocktailing can get quite complex. So I have ways I do that. Again, Sullivan, he got one, two, three, four, five, eight, an eight mushroom cocktail at a relatively high dose. And that was largely intuitive, um, but et voila, you know, so look. And then when, when you have these extracts, are they alcohol-based extracts? Do you like? They're powders. Oh, so they're, powders. they're interesting yeah. so you can mix them in food um most mostly they will just eat them um you can mix them in food you can they'll readily dissolve in water if you need to syringe if you have an animal is not eating usually though if if you work at the on the gut first you can get them you can kick start the eating with him the thing that kicked his eating on so some of it was the clay which i often use with dogs who won't eat um but some and of it Go ahead. Dr. Martha, is that a bentonite or a French green or what's your, do you have? It's, it's a blend of clays. It's some bentonite and it's some Montmerlinat. It's, um, I use a product made by Advanced Biological Concepts. It's called MOP. It is made for horses and dogs specifically. So it's a good liver, liver detoxer. Um, it really, really quiets down an irritated gut because it sops up. I mean, you know, it, it's called mop because it sops up gunk. If, if you have an animal who's having diarrhea, now I use this more with horses and less with dogs. It does help with that because it will absorb excess water, but it's very soothing too. So often when you give it to them within 24 hours, you see they, they kind of uptick like, oh, and, and probably their gut hurt is probably what that is. In his case, I also, and, and this was another kind of a long shot, <laughs> but I thought, well, what, you know, why not? Let's do this, not gonna hurt him. I also put him on a horse, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gut reset product made for horses. However, however, it is human grade. Um, and it does three things. It, it puts in some desirable flora, it inhibits undesirable flora. And it has a whopping dose of antibodies and an immune boost. So what's that? That is called rejuvenate. I've never heard of it. It's it's new. It is made by the company that makes Chape. If you know what Chape is. Chap C H A P or Chap Chap. C A C H A F F H A Y E Chape. Yes. So chape, so chape is an equine product. So it's fermented alfalfa hay. So chape is a, a company based in Texas. That was their only product, chape. That is a fabulous food. If we we're talking about horses, I could give you all kinds of stories about chape. But um, they recently entered the supplement market. So so rejuvenate is there. So and you have to watch because if you Google, there's another product that comes up. It's not theirs. Um, and I can send you the. If you want to send out to people or you want to, I can also, uh, what's the best way to do that? Well, just, you, you just email me the links and I let will me email you a live stream. I, yeah, I have, a, I have a discount code for that as well. Um, so, so Rejuvenate, does, it does those three things. So um, the, the Chaffee people, the person who designed it there had told me, he said, look, you can use this in any, anyone, a human, a horse, a dog, or a cat, 
who's having gut issues for immune problems and it will help. So I sent them and it's this giant tube. <laughs> so I sent them two, two tubes of rejuvenate and it's this tarry black stuff. Um, and they tried to shove it in his mouth and he wouldn't eat it. So they put it on their hand and he snapped it up. So, so he had that for, they actually gave him more than I told them for longer. Um, I don't know how much that played into it, but he literally within 24 hours of eating that first dose, he wanted food. Wow. So that, and is that a humic fulvic acid product because it's black? No, there is a tree bark extract in there. Um, that is what makes it black and they have not really disclosed what that is, but you know, that proprietary, right? They're not going to, there's a list of ingredients, but there's things not on there, obviously. All I can tell you is that every dog I've used it in who would not eat has upticked max of 48 hours and been willing to eat. And then um, in horses, I've had near miraculous turnarounds with gut problems, very quick, just very quick. So I'm so excited it, about this. And yeah, someone in the chat actually does feed it to their horse. Yeah. 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 Very so, cool. so that's, and you don't use it all the time. You use it periodically. So this is not something you give constantly. So you might give it for, I think I told them, give it for seven days and stop and then just wait. And then if you feel like he's sort of going in the wrong direction, restart it, but you don't do it all the time. Cause you, you need the gut to kind of get its act together and start to work well. And, and in, and there, in there, he wouldn't eat any of the, they had all, uh, anyway, the food, they had all kinds of food stuffs they had bought for him. They were making him food and cooking him food and wouldn't eat any of it. So we just went to a super simple, I don't know what they're doing now. Um, but originally he, cons he consented, he would eat chopped steak with a little oatmeal. I said, fine, feed him that. He has to eat something. I don't care what he eats. And we may have put him at that point on a humic fulvic acid probiotic. Um, I usually use the one from Biostart, but, um, but I don't remember, I have to look. So, so anyway, as of yesterday, this is where he is. He's good, he's good. So does that have anything to do with me? Not really, this animal was not supposed to die um, now. So, so power of the tools. I, I don't know. All I can tell you is that's what I did and that's what happened. And uh, shocked um, me, but I'll somebody take it. Wanted, somebody asked, um, does Emu Biome make their own mushrooms? Like where, yes. where's the they, source of that? They, they, they do all their own stuff. So I don't, they have places they grow. I don't, I don't have the details of that. I've used their stuff for, um, four years, five years, I don't know. Um, the owner of the company is probably one of the world experts in the actions of medicinal mushrooms. So I've learned a lot from him. I've had hundreds of hours of tutorials from him. You can Google mushrooms and there are numerous published papers on the properties of medicinal mushrooms and cancer. They, they are used routinely in Asian countries as part of cancer protocols. We do not use them here. But it, if you have a cancer in Japan, it's it's part of your list, you know, which mushrooms you get, turkey tail, reishi, you Which might have some radiation. Yeah, I mean, so so there is a there, so the point is there is a large scientific literature on these mushrooms. It's there. Um, it's not that we don't know what they do. We do know what they do. What we don't know really is how to dose them in animals. We don't really know that. Um, right. And, and interesting, we've had a couple mushroom experts. So we had um, Dr. Silver and Angela Ardolino both on this platform talking about their protocols. And, um, but like you said, it really depends on the environment, the terrain that it's grown on for the vitality and the efficacy. And I love the fact that mushrooms look like tumors, like they kind of point you in that direction. Well, they have really complex chemistry. So, so again, if, if you're biology minded, if you just, if you poke around on PubMed or, or someplace that is not just someone's blog. So, so the problem with blogs is a lot of that information is opinion. And if they don't reference it, it it's, it's opinion. So you don't know. Um, but if you have, you, there are plenty of hundreds and hundreds of published scientific papers on the properties of different mushrooms. There are hundreds of them. 
So there is, you know, so again, this goes back to my training in evidence-based medicine. Do we have evidence that these have anti-cancer actions? We absolutely do. We have huge amounts of evidence. Do we do trials with them in this country? Not really. <laughs> there are a couple ongoing trials. Um, I might argue the dose is not correct, but no one asked me before they started a trial. Um, there are lots of um, case histories and trials in Asian countries. And again, as I said, they're routinely used as cancer protocols there. So, so this is an area, and this is probably why originally I gravitated to the mushrooms because there is a database here. There is an evidence base. The, the piece that's really not clear and that is more seat of the pants um, is, is again the dosing. So I gave Sullivan a heavy dose for a dog his size, figuring you're, you can handle this. So let's, let's see. So did that push him into rapid remission? You know, I don't know. I don't know. But that he wasn't in remission before he got the mushrooms and the rejuvenate and the clay. Let's put it that way. Um, and then he went into remission. And now he's good. So he stays on the mushrooms. He stays on. I have him cycle him on and off the clay. You don't need the clay all the time. If you're eating well and the, the gut is good, then you don't need the clay right now. Um, so I just have them watch him. So if he starts to down tick, then we'll make an adjustment. Excellent. Oh, I lost her. Oh, there he is right there. What a cutie. Hey, Dr. Martha, I lost your live stream. Maybe it's me. Let me see if she comes back. And we still have more to go. Okay, we saw the photo of Sullivan and we have you back now. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Dr. Martha. All right, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I can't see anything, but I don't need to see anything. So if you go to the next slot, oh, there we are. Okay, I can see things, yay. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, you know, what, one, one last case example. So this is just on the concept of resilience, which I think is absolutely critical to understand um, the process of dealing, I mean, we're dealing with anybody with a serious illness, but certainly when we deal with our animals. So, so this is Scout. Now, Scout did not have cancer, but, but I mean, he's such a fabulous example. Oh, we lost her again. Darn it. Can you hear me? You're back. Okay, I don't know what's happening. My internet sucks. This is why I didn't want to have the PowerPoint on my screen. So anyway, Scout, um, so he's a Queensland healer, an older guy, as you can see from his age. So this is not a young dog. And, and his owner, I, the only reason she knew me is because she had a horse who foundered um, and um, we were able to put her back together and get her back to work. And she was completely sound at the end of that. So, so I, the question she asked me, um, which frequent people often ask is, well, have you done necrotizing fasciitis before? Well, no, <laughs> there, there really, there are very few dogs that have necrotizing fasciitis um, that survive it. Can you still hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay. So, you guys so Facebook, I, let me know I, if the sound is bad. Yeah, because I can't, I can't see anything. So, so anyway, he had necrotizing fasciitis. It, it destroyed the skin on his and his coat on his face and his forelegs. I did not put those pictures in because that's grim. There's basically raw red, soppy tissue on his front legs and his entire face. Um, they were able to get the infection to stop. They had to hammer him with basically every antibiotic known to man to do that. But they got it to stop. So then she brings him home. He's in severe kidney failure. He will not eat. He has all kinds of neurological symptoms. He's exhausted. I mean, he's just ill from the treatment in addition to being ill from this horrific infection. Um, I don't know that they've ever had a dog survive this and certainly not a 13 year old healer. So when he gets to me, he has nothing that looks like that face that you see. And um, his forelegs are raw, 
nasty, oozing mess. Um, so we started with him and, you know, the question, have you done this before? Well, no, I get that question a lot because I see a lot of weird, rare things. So, but there are principles that inform the process of supporting the body to heal. You don't necessarily have to have seen that particular thing, but there are ways to support the body to grow skin back, grow hair back, certainly to help with kidney failure and certainly to help neurological. Oh, did we lose you again? Are you back? How did you lose me? Okay, I can barely hear you, but I yeah. and I can't see you at all. Well, I can't see anything. I probably have to go in and go out. But anyway, the point the point of Scout is he had he he was a mess, and he's an older dog, and again, who would predict that he could rebound from this? I, you know, not me, but I don't make predictions. I shut up and just do what I think will help. So he very quickly turned around his protocol. He started eating, his skin grew back, his hair grew back. So you see in the picture, he's got hair on his face and, and you can't see his forelegs, but that grew back completely. Um, there is a little patch on one side of his muzzle that is a little bit bare, but he has full hair on his face. He did not, um, this was probably... Oh, you guys, I keep losing Martha. If you guys want to connect with Martha, this is her contact info. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I may have to just dial in on my phone, Poppy. Anyway, the, the point of this is it's not, uh, I thought, let me see if I can. Let me escape this, you guys, and quit sharing. And then maybe we can get you back, Martha. Maybe it's dragging on your Wi-Fi. There you are. I see you. You there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't yeah. know. That's okay. It's so I have, there's, Susie, I'm going to ask a couple of questions before we have to bounce. I have another appointment. You guys, I'm a, I'm a holistic animal practitioner. So I do take appointments and I have an appointment coming up and, um, Susie wanted to know, she has an American bully with mast cell and on the rear thigh, vet recommended removal. And she gives them quercetin, five defender mushroom and wanted to know, I think I lost her all together, you guys. I'm gonna, Susie, you have been awesome. And I thank you for all your support and comments. Um, let me see if we can get Martha back, but I only have five minutes left. So if I can't get Martha back, I'm going to try to get your answer for you, or you guys can reach out to Martha, Dr. Martha Faraday, and I will put her contact info later on. And so, yes, and my contact info, you can always find me here at the Cancer Free Canine Facebook page, um, Poppy Phillips on my Facebook page, I have a website, www.equine-hai.com. And then also I have the Holistic Animal Insights private membership. And so um, there's lots of ways to contact me. You can text me, you can DM me, but then also for Martha, you guys, I think this was really informative. Nobody's talked about Clay today nobody's talked about or through all the the interviews i've done nobody's talked about clay nobody's talked about eggplant nobody's talked about serapeptase or enzymatic enzymes so i i think that was really an awesome live stream i hope you got a lot out of it i will put it on the on leave it in the youtube or put it on youtube leave it on the facebook page under the guide section um, somebody commented that you can't find it if you access Facebook in a certain way. You just have to scroll. Um, but also, I do believe that I do get some of this stuff blocked. So I apologize for that. And um, just because it's a touchy topic, I do feel like things get um, diverted and they're hard to harder to find. So I apologize for that. We do this monthly and I try to do this bi-monthly is have 
um, success stories. So whether you're a pet parent with a success story or a pet professional with su success stories, I want to hear it. I want to share it. I think it's good news and it's encouraging and it helps everyone. So thank you everyone for today. I hope it was um, awesome. I, I learn, I always learn from these. So you guys have a wonderful end of the month. And I cannot believe that pumpkin spice lattes are out already. It just seems kind of wrong in August. All right, take care. <laughs>